Compared to advanced the human situation, also the questionable use of philosophical terms but in natural science. So I would uh, say to Aurelien, you presuppose the theory of reference. You use the term refers to in a metaphorical way. Theory of, of reference is a very complicated philosophical theory. So you cannot take it for granted. And now uh, let me give a, a que question to, for you. We all know that knowledge is reflexive for phenomenon. If somebody knows something but does not know that he knows that, then this is not knowledge. So science must have reflexive knowledge, must have criteria of scientific validity, must have knowledge of its methodology, of its logic, and so on. In this sense, science must have reflexive knowledge. And philosophy, by definition, is reflexive knowledge. Therefore, science ends in philosophical knowledge. And philosophical knowledge operates on science. Therefore, would you agree with the thesis that science without philosophy is blind and philosophy without science is empty? Well, obviously so. I cannot but agree with what you had to say. Now, the, uh, the only comment I want to add is that here, here again, it's interesting to, to look at uh, the history of the past centuries, how things became what they are today. If you look at the beginning of uh, modern science, at the times of the so-called scientific revolution, beginning with the 16th century, Look at people like uh, Galileo or Descartes and ask them, what are they doing? What is their job? They won't tell you that they are physicists. They will tell you that they are natural philosophers. Which means that at that time, philosophy is splitting into various branches. You have uh, uh, theological philosophy, uh, law, juridic philosophy, political philosophy, and so on, and natural philosophy. But the, uh, the work by people like Descartes and Galileo definitely is not separated, as can be seen from the personality of Descartes himself. Is he a physicist? Is he a philosopher? Is he a writer? Is Pascal a writer? Is Pascal a mathematician? This question has uh, no answer. It's an answer which we try retrospectively to project with our own categories, where physicists and philosophers nowadays are separate uh, corporations. And what happens in the past four centuries is that, uh, concerning science at least, it became more and more, not only specialized, but more and more separate, with a great efficiency. This has to be recognized. It was very successful, in some sense, to separate itself from complicated philosophical discussions. And uh, the technical accomplishments of physics, which uh, came rather late, contrary to what most people think, the, uh, the goal of uh, Descartes when he says, uh, uh, thanks to science, uh, man will become like master and owner of nature, this was a program which, were, which did not start to be realized until the very end of the 17th century. In the 16th and uh, 17th century, science knowledge is of no real concrete use. But since the end of the 18th century, the beginning of 19th, that's all, more, not much more than two centuries. Of course, then science nourished uh, uh, technology, and this is, uh, this is the world in which we live in. And the point is that this efficiency of science has been such that it is nowadays turning against it. That is, 
political and economical powers are asking science to give result, concrete result, uh, on the short term, which it does. But by doing so, uh, it is to be feared that this prevents us to having a long-term perspective and to look for future, uh, uh, future knowledge which would be quite different. Science is uh, uh, myopic, not only blind, but myopic uh, to, today. And that's uh, my, uh, uh, this is what makes me uh, sad in some sense. You, you see, we, we are living in the, in the Roman setting. If, yes, if I ask you for the name of a great Greek scientist, no problem. Anybody will answer Archimedes, uh, Euclid, uh, and so on and so on, uh, tens of them. Now, I'm asking you, I am asking you, the name of a great Roman scientist of the same greatness. Hmm? I wouldn't uh, agree. Uh, I have uh, the strongest admiration for Lucretius, but he was more a philosopher than a writer, and he did not invent a single thing. In, in fact, he put in words, Latin words, the idea of uh, Eusebius, uh, Democritus, and so on. So despite the... I, I love Lucretius, and the, uh, okay? But I don't think you can compare him as bringer of scientific ideas with people like uh, Archimedes, Euclid, and so on and so on. Which means that if you look at the uh, Roman history as such, here you have a big civilization, uh, the one over the Greeks, and they took from Greece almost anything, religion, uh, poetry, uh, and so on and so on. Not science. And you have a great civilization which ruled over the Mediterranean for centuries. The Pax uh, Romana, that is, it is not nothing, three or four centuries, relative, relative uh, quite. Yet, it is a civilization which was not interested in the fundamental knowledge of nature. And this should make us think. Perhaps we are entering such a world. Could be the case. There is nothing, nothing which guarantees the, uh, the fact that a scientific endeavor is due to last forever. Could take another example, the Arabo-Islamic civilization, which has a wonderful scientific civilization from the 17th, sorry, from the, seven, from the 7th, 8th century to the 13th. But then, Arabic science just dwindled for inner reasons, not because of the conquest by uh, Europe, for inner reasons. So I think we have reasons to, to ask ourselves about what will be our future, future concerning uh, science. It's probably true that uh, there is a possibility that science, this is what is happening today, is turning to techno science. That is knowledge which is only uh, aimed at uh, short-term uh, technical results, uh, unless the other side, the interest for philosophy, and so on and so on. So we have a great responsibility, I think. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I want to say that uh, so to answer many of these comments, I'm not a philosopher, and I've discussed many times with Fanyu about some of the concepts and ideas, so I'm just amateur. But still, uh, so when I was thinking about uh, this argument very hard about uh, what uh, Professor uh, Levi was saying, 
uh, I, was I think that this idea of invariant is, even though if I don't express properly what it means, it's like a mo valise, and I think it has a great reach, and I think I will try to develop it more, not now, but I, I, ju I would like just, just to say that what I mean by invariant, by quoting another example. For example, you take the, the, the invention of Lavoisier. Lavoisier measured the composition of, uh, of the air, oxygen, hydrogen, and so on. This is what I call an invariant. The, in the context of Lavoisier, it was certainly not what we refer today. We know that elements are the same, but it's certainly not the same way he was looking at them. But this is an invariant, because even now, even though that we know the oxygen, he didn't know what oxygen is. He didn't know it was an atom, it has a structure, it has detailed content. This is a totally invariant, and you can repeat Lavoisier's experiment now with exactly the same account. Now we can take also somebody mentioned Euclid or Archimedes, the law of Archimedes. Archimedes was living in a time where he had absolutely no idea what is the most science today and what, uh, the, but still his discovery is an invariant and it is taught as it is today. This is what I meant by invariant. So independently of any context, context you will associate to this, there are some discoveries that do not change across, even though they bear many meanings to history and they come from different meanings, they are invariant. And I would go further to say that those disciplines or concepts that are not invariant do not belong to science and perhaps to philosophy or poetry. But this is how I would discriminate. I will pursue myself to make this more um, precise, probably for the next meeting. But I, I, I personally believe it, it has a meaning. Thank you. No, I, I will not comment. Just to, to state once again that we disagree. That is very interesting. Thank you for disagreeing, because it gives place to future discussions. Thank you to you all for your comments, discussions, and uh, for being here. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I'm very glad to be here, especially in such uh, nice surroundings. And uh, I want first to extend my uh, warmest thanks to the University of Split for this invitation, and first of all to Professor Flanio Sokolic and to Professor Zarnic. Not to forget Gabriela Bazic, who have been so helpful during all this stay. Thank you very much to all. Now, at the, uh, the talk I'm going to give, I pro probably have to sketch the contest context in which uh, it uh, was raised out. And this context is the one of the so-called science wars in the years uh, 1990, 20 years ago. What became to be called the science wars was a response to modern or postmodern, so-called postmodern studies in science and te technology illustrated by such names as Bruno Latour, uh, Paul Feyerabend in philosophy, David Bro, Harry Collins, Simon Schaeffer in history and sociology of science. The work of these people in sociology, in philosophy, putting the accent on the social, political, ideological conditions of scientific practice, were at that time strongly attacked as being detrimental to science and leading to a relativistic stance detracting the validity of scientific knowledge. This was done by what I would call a new scientistic academic congregation. Uh, it culminated in the Sokal affair, which I remind you. In 1996, 
The physicist Alan Sokol, who was a very good and well-known physicist, American physicist, wrote a deliberately nonsensical paper, a pastiche, so he claimed, a pastiche of some studies in science and technology, and uh, sent his paper to a journal called Social Text, was a well-known journal in sociology of science. This paper was honestly and seriously published by the journal, and when Sokal revealed that it was just a hoax, a joke, furious debates erupted between a number of social scientists on the one hand and hard scientists on the other hand. This led to the publication in 1997, first in French, of a book by Alan Sokal and Jean Briquemont, who was a, Bel he was a Belgian physicist, a book entitled Impostures Intellectuelles, Intellectual Impostures. It was soon published in, in English. I don't know if it has been published in Croatian or in some other language. Um, this book was based upon a collection of quotations by philosophers, writers, sociologists, allegedly, according to the authors, Sokal and Brickmont, proving the scientific illiteracy and ultra-relativism of their social colleagues. No doubt, philosophers and sociologists sometimes use physics and mathematics in a questionable way. But is this a new development? And is postmodernity really implicated here? In fact, the whole history of modern science is studded with such episodes. I will start by revisiting an emblematic case, the analysis of which could clarify the fundamental problems posed by the charges of Sokal and Briquemont and their likes. So my first uh, section deals which, with, which, with what I call the uncertainties of physics. And of course, it has to do with the uh, well-known so-called principle of uncertainty, which was, which was proposed three quarters of a century ago by Heisenberg, one of the greatest physicists of the beginning of the 20th century, as an essential element of the then nascent quantum theory, it was just at the beginning of quantum theory, 1925 or so. In its most commonplace form, the principle is supposed to assert the impossibility of knowing simultaneously the position and the speed of a quantum particle, and is supposed to be related to an unavoidable and uncontrollable perturbation of a physical system by the very act of observing it. This principle has given rise to countless comments and exegesis. The following one comes from a former president of the French Republic, and is quite typical. In fact, it was written by Giscard d'Estaing some 20 or 30 years ago. I quote, the Heisenberg uncertain principle has taught us that information can modify the state of things and that knowledge is not neutral. As a consequence, it seems to me that the social system must be analyzed in a new light." End of quotation. You see, the idea is that what physicists have found must be used, applied, and uh, in, uh, in social and human sciences. Analogous extrapolations can be found in the writings of reputable thinkers all the way to the vitalist philosophy of Teilhard de Chardin. I quote, in an Heisenbergian universe, the quantity of information, as it is continually supplied by the action of each corpuscle, varies and is liable to augment indefinitely through a better arrangement of the system. Would not the vitalization of matter where it is possible, be a sort of outlet for this ever-increasing mass of indetermined. This makes absolutely no sense for a physicist. It's just sheer nonsense. 
No area of modern thought, whether it be economics or sociology, metaphysics or literary criticism, has escaped the temptation of exploiting this principle to its own ends. Yet, and this uh, is my main point, Yes, it is, yet it is not only in literature, philosophy, and social sciences that such careless interpretations appeared, but definitely within physics itself. It would be fastidious to review quantum physics textbooks and popularization essays, often written by some of the more famous physicists, in order to compile the innumerable comments on the uncertainty principle, which present it as the scientific proof that our ability to know the world has now run into intrinsic limitations, often compounding it with some equally questionable extrapolation of Bohr's complementarity principle. For instance, the great astrophysicist Sir James Jeans could argue in the 30s that Heisenberg's proof that, quote, nature above all, abhors, above all precision and uncertainty was the root of human free will and ability to act on the world. And it is in such an eminent source as the Encyclopedia Britannica that a reputed physicist invoked the profound philosophical implications due to the intrinsic limitations on the precision of experiments to conclude on the necessary humility of man with respect to nature. Another physicist, Nobel Prize winner, French one, Alfred Kassler, wrote, quote, if it is true that any microphysical observation is by itself an intervention and thus an alteration of the observed phenomenon, it becomes impossible to assert that we may reach an objective reality independent of ourselves. From my part, I would go as far as saying that the same is true of the distinction between soul and body and that it could be a great philosophical gain to think this distinction along the lines of the complementarity model introduced in physics by Niels Bohr." End of quote. Consider finally one of the most preposterous proposals to draw political conclusions from the uncertainty and complementarity principle. I quote, the thesis, lights consist of particles, and the antithesis, lights consists of waves, fought one another until they were united in the synthesis of quantum mechanics. Only why not apply it to the thesis liberalism or capitalism, the antithesis communism, and expect a synthesis? There must exist a relation between the latitude of freedom delta F and of regulation delta R of the type delta F delta R of the order of P. But what is the political constant P? I must leave this to a future quantum theory of human affairs. This was uh, wrote in all seriousness by one of the founding fathers of quantum theory, Max Born. It is thus totally unfounded to attribute the blunders of social scientists and literary scholars to their own specific misunderstanding or cynical exploitation of scientific statements. Such interpretations, in fact, result from the difficulties met by the creators of quantum theory themselves in understanding its essence. Like any new theory, this one, quantum theory, could only be born within the gang of the very conceptualization it was to cast off and make obsolete. You cannot tell new things with new words. Always new things appear in old words and old language, and then you have to change your way of talking and speaking. Viewed with the advantage of insight and experience, 
The original statement by Heisenberg was an attempt to express the inadequacy of classical physics by sticking to its own language, where position and velocity are well-defined and uniquely valued physical magnitude instead of going over to a specific quantile formulation like we have today. We know now that the Heisenberg inequalities, as they should be more soberly called, express a correlation between the intrinsic dispersions of quantum magnitudes, the numerical spectra of which show an ineluctable extension. There is nothing here that could warrant such ideas as that of impassable limits placed by nature herself on, your, on our yearning for knowledge, or that of uncontrollable perturbation to the world caused by our observing it. Furthermore, these dubious interpretations have been reinforced by the introduction due to the originators of quantum theory themselves of the inappropriate and unjustified terminology of uncertainties, which has allowed so many aberrant exploitations over more than, than half a century. If one were to scrutinize the history of this formulation, it would be seen that it results from a rather uncertain choice by Hasenberg himself in his initial writings in German followed by unverified, unchecked translations in English. Heisenberg first uses the word Ungenauigkeit, which indeed corresponds to the idea of uncertainty, more or less. But soon, in his uh, founding paper, makes a better choice that of Unbestimmtheit, that is indeterminacy, which is certainly closer to the deep meaning of the notion he introduces. While in common use for some time in the 30s, indeterminacy was unfortunately to disappear and leaving free reign to uncertainty, except in a few languages. For instance, in Italian today, they are still speaking about the indeterminazione principio. The above incrimination of the great quantum physicist should not be taken as criticism ad hominem. For the epistemological stand cannot be divorced from the philosophical and political context of the times, that of the early 20th century. In many works, which are well known today, but not, it seems, to most physicists, modern historians of science have shown, for instance, how the ideas of Bohr regarding the impossibility of specific and autonomous knowledge of the quantum world were deeply grounded in the philosophy of renunciation going back to Kierkegaard, and how the conceptions of Heisenberg involving an essential indeterminacy of the world emerged from his idealism as a young reactionary activist at the end of the First World War. More generally, the often hasty forms taken by the, necessarily, the necessary critical rejection of the classical concepts of physics are too similar to the cultural calling into question typical of the Weimar period in Germany to be entirely coincidental. There is no relativism in such statements, but merely a demonstration that science, even of the most formalized kind, and with no pretension to invalidating its claims, cannot be abstracted from it, its historical setting. In the second part of this talk, I will generalize what I just said to uh, what I uh, do not hesitate to call the immaturity of contemporary science. 
This episode, the one concerning the uncertain principle, highlights several negative characteristics of the development, which one thus should hesitate to call progress, of the development of contemporary science, which are found in many domains. If the, epistem if the epistemological myopia of newly hatched scientific theory is unavoidable, this childhood ailment is nowadays tending to become chronic, condemning contemporary science to persistent immaturity. Of course, just I already said it, any new idea, science or not, emerges amidst unavoidable confusion. It reaches a relative but never definitive conceptual solidity after a reform period which is much longer and more complex than the inaugural revolutionary phase. This recasting, to borrow a word from Bachelard epistemology, this recasting which needs to follow the initial breakthrough in order to validate and stabilize the new doctrine can only be the result of lengthy and patient endeavors aimed at implementing and disseminating knowledge. During the 19th century, classical physics was able, in general, to dismantle the necessary but provisional scaffolding required for the construction of its theories. One only thus could the proper structure and conceptualization of these theories appear in full light. A major example of this process is given by the emergence of the notion of field, physical fields. From its first naive pictures with Faraday and the mechanical models contrived by the young Maxwell to its accession to conceptual autonomy and ontology in the treatise of electricity and magnetism of the major Maxwell and in the work of Hertz, Heaviside, and others. The 20th century, while witnessing the birth of theoretical domains of undeniable scope and interest, relativities, quantum theories, etc., did not, however, produce accomplishments as remarkable from the point of view of the conceptual mastery. Many fundamental questions raised in the very early days of these investigations, beginning with the 20th century, have not yet received satisfactory answers after almost one century. Worse, the solution to some of these essential riddles, when they exist, are often unknown to most scientists who maintain an archaic view of their own field. Such is the case of quantum so-called non-separability or of the so-called origin of the universe in cosmology. These deficiencies result from the excessive division of labor which characterizes modern scientific practice. The ever-growing specialization of research domains, like the, inc like the increasing split between research and other scientific activities, teaching, popularization, implementation, drastically inhibit recasting processes and delay their collective assimilation. A relevant aspect of this immaturity is the mediocrity of the linguistic in endeavor of modern physics. Physicists themselves, in formulating very abstract and specific concepts, are guilty of having heedlessly introduced terms fraught with deep epistemological ambiguities. We have already stressed the issue concerning the so-called quantum uncertainties. But such is already the case for Einsteinian relativity, a very inappropriate term indeed from the modern point of view, which rather stresses the invariant, that is absolute, aspects of space-time. Einstein himself, in the 20s, recognized that his relativist wording resulted from an unhappy choice. 
no doubt influenced by, the, by its cultural context, namely that on, of the 1905 Zurich, where apart from Einstein himself, people like Tristan Sara, Lenin, and many others were roaming and putting into question many dogmas. The evolution of physics since that time has only aggravated the situation. The common practice today is to name phenomena far remote from common experience using deceptively familiar terms with a strong imaginative charge. Big Bang, black holes, charmed particles, super strings, dark matter, and so on are cases in point. Clearly, such a strategy reflects more a marketing-oriented approach rather than a creative and disciplined use of language. One may recall, for example, that the term Big Bang was concocted by an opponent to the theory, namely Fred Hall, great uh, English astrophysicist, and he uh, proposed the term Big Bang as a form of mockery, in fact. The term was then co-opted by the mainstream advocates following a process well known in postmodern advertising and marketing. To wit, the fate of such slang words as grunge or punk and so on promoted to the glamorous universe of fashion and entertainment. One could develop similar analysis concerning the wording of whole fields such as deterministic chaos or catastrophe theory, the real and deep intellectual interest of which is masked and distorted rather than revealed and clarified by these uncontrolled appellations. There is a striking difference between the linguistic policies of scientists in the 19th and the 20th century. The masters of classical physics were great creators of words, in their wariness of commonsensical interpretation, they did, not, they did not hesitate to call on both reason and imagination, coining new words for new ideas in order to emphasize their novelty. Such terms as entropy, electronics, now part of everyday discourse, bear witness to this sustained endeavor. And when they opted for a word borrowed from ordinary parlance, they did so only after explicit critical discussion. It's interesting in that respect to read the musings of Maxwell on the denomination of differential operators, culminating with terms such as curl. Maxwell devotes pages and pages asking himself what word you will use. Of course, physicists cannot be blamed for quotation, giving new meanings to the words of the tribe. That's a quotation from French poet Mallarmé. But they can and should be made accountable for these new meanings and first of all be required to master them. A more conscious and more inventive relation to language certainly could significantly reduce the risk of conceptual drift. For the occasional dubious metaphorical use of scientific notions in other fields often is but a secondary echo of the uncontrolled glossolalia found in science itself. Third section from physics to anti-philosophy. Not only are the tenets of uh, the neo-scientism illustrated by people such as Sokal and Brickman, thus mistaken regarding the origins of the misunderstandings they want to denounce, they also glide too easily from blunder to contempt. The anti-philosophical casualness and arrogance of so many physicists today prevent them from undertaking, undertaking the necessary autocritical elucidation of their formulations and conceptions. Their presumption here is only equal to their artlessness. We will not succumb to the temptation of compiling a full collection of quotations 
symmetrical to that of Sokal and Brickmont. Let us nevertheless cast a glance at some writings of several well-known physicists. Thus, Steven Weinberg, a very highly respected theoretical physicist, Nobel Prize, does not balk at giving the title Against Philosophy to a chapter of his book, Dreams of a Final Theory, in which he attempts to show that the knowledge of philosophy is of no use to physicists, and he professes the, quote, unreasonable ineffectiveness of philosophy, end of quote. No surprise, then, if Weinberg supported Sokol in a much-discussed article in the New York Review of Books. A remarkable feature of this paper is that Weinberg, far from regretting the alleged ineffectiveness of philosophy, is perfectly satisfied with a split which he claims to be symmetrical. I quote, in my view, Weinberg, in my view, with two large exceptions, the results of research in physics, as opposed, say, to psychology, have no legitimate implications whatever for culture or politics or philosophy. The discoveries of physics may become relevant to philosophy and culture when we learn the origin of the universe or the final laws of nature, but not for the present. The first of my exceptions to this statement is jurisdictional. Discoveries in science sometimes reveal that topics like matter, space, and time, which have been thought to be proper subjects for philosophical argument, actually belong to the domain of ordinary science. The other, more important exception to my statement is the profound cultural effect of the discovery going back to the work of Newton, that nature is strictly, strictly nature in general, strictly governed by impersonal mathematical laws. End of Weinberg's quote. Thus, the only relation between science and philosophy that Weinberg considers legitimate is the complete dispossession of the latter, philosophy, by the former, science. Let physicists search for the finals of laws of nature, or rather find them, for Weinberg has no doubts about the success of the quest, and all questions, philosophical, political, and cultural, will fall under the jurisdiction of ordinary science. As for Stephen Hawking, a master of modern cosmology. He shares the same dream of an ultimate theory, but adds the phantasm of omnipotence to that of omniscience. I quote, if we discover a complete theory, it should in time be understandable by everyone, not just by a few scientists, then we shall all, philosophers, scientists, and just ordinary people, be able to take part in the discussion of the question of why it is that we and the universe exist. If we find the answer to that, it would be the ultimate triumph of human reason, for then we should know the mind of God." End of quote. This very last sentence of his best-selling book is not an example of irony or tongue-in-cheek English humor, as shown by the whole contents of the book where God is omnipresent. True Anglo-Saxon culture is less adverse than the Latin one to invoking the name of God, were it in scientific matters, thus showing, despite its biblical puritanism, little respect for the third commandment, you shall not invoke in vain God's name. Richard Feynman, certainly one of the most independent and original minds of 20th century physics, did not entertain as naive a position concerning the question of the fundamental laws and ultimate components of matter, and was critical of the presumptuousness of reductionists. He nevertheless shared the arrogance of many of his colleagues with respect, or rather disrespect, to philosophy. Quoting Feynman, <coughs> philosophers, incidentally, 
say a great deal about what is absolutely necessary for science, and it is always, so far as one can see, rather naive and probably wrong. My son is taking a course in philosophy, and last night we are looking at something by Spinoza, and there was the most childish, childish reasoning. There were all these attributed attributes and substances, all this meaningless string around, and we started to laugh. Now, how could we do that? Here is this great Dutch philosopher, and we are laughing at him. Well, it is because there was no excuse for it. In that same period, there was Newton, there was Harvey studying the circulation of the blood. There were people with methods of analysis by which progress was being made. You can take every one of Spinoza's propositions and take the contrary propositions and look at the world and you cannot tell which is right. End of quote by Feynman. Is it not permitted in the face of so much candid impertinence to doubt whether physicists are authorized to exert, as such, a validity check on any discourse referring to the discipline. What indeed is the value of the scientificity trademark they want to keep control of? To those physicists who claim responsibility for a punctilious censorship of philosophy, should one not respond by tit for tat and invoke the old parable of the moat and the beam. The followers of the neo-scientism credo show the same innocence as regards the sociology of science. The relativism they are so scared of is but a quixotic windmill they take for a giant, at least, at least, on this side of the Atlantic. One must concede to Sokol that in the United States, one can indeed find some extravagant forms of ultra-relativism which on behalf of an ethnicist or feminist multiculturalism reduce scientific knowledge to the status of a mere belief. But in Europe, not a single one of the serious critiques of contemporary science shares the caricatural view according to which the scientific theory would be a pure production of ideology. It is in fact the converse which seems so difficult to accept for the adepts of neoscientism, namely that the scientific theory cannot be a pure product of reason. The too often repeated affirmation of scientific objectivity is not sufficient by and large to understand the status and role of scientific knowledge in our society. At the same time, the advocates of an abstract and neutral vision of science curiously show little confidence in the validity of scientific statement when they assimilate, as they usually do, a constructivist conception of science with a relativistic one. That science is a socially and culturally determined process is sufficiently proven by the undeniable contingent denomination of its objects and notions. To take just two, two very classical and old examples, do not electrons find their etymological but also observational origin in amber, electron in Greek, and galaxies in milk? If words enshrine history, how could it be otherwise for ideas? To stay with the electron, its history furnishes a telling example of the complex elaboration of any scientific notion to the point that historians can seriously claim that, quotation, nobody has really discovered the electron. It was such a complicated and collective process that it's very hard to say he, for instance, Thompson, is the discoverer of the electron. The historical relativity inherent in the production of idea does not doom them to arbitrariness, but certainly calls for much, subtle, much subtler 
assessment of the validity of scientific knowledge that a mere identification with abstract and absolute objectivity. Furthermore, the assessment of the validity of a piece of knowledge does not exhaust its meaning. The question of its relevance needs to be asked as well. There are very many exact mathematical theorems, correct physical measurements, and verifiable biological observations which are of no interest in all the senses, either material or intellectual, of the world. In these novel times, when science has to work with no longer increasing resources, this problem, problem of relevance, becomes a crucial one and the most strenuous controversies among scientists bear more on the priorities of research programs than on their qualities. This is why a pure epistemological reflection no longer has any impact on the effective development of science and must take due account of its concrete social, social organization. The context of scientific production can no longer be distinguished, be distinguished from its text. My fourth section, section comes back to the question of language, deals with what I call the necessary metaphors. Sokol and Brickmont insist on considering as mere metaphors the references to science made by the authors they incriminate, and seem to believe that it would suffice to denounce the abusive recourse to such metaphorical uses. But in so doing, they show a deep misunderstanding regarding the status of figures of discourse in the elaboration of knowledge. However trivial this may appear, it is necessary to recall that there is no enunciation without metaphorization. Beyond the cases we have already discussed in modern physics, the whole terminology of classical physics is witness to the, this permanent metaphorical play. Forces and work in mechanics, charges and fields in electromagnetism, rays and waves in optics, it is all too easy to multiply examples of words taken from ordinary language and endowed with a much more specific uh, meaning within science. What might be, one might be tempted to deny the essential ambiguity of such denominations by arguing that once the corresponding notions are defined and formalized, the polysemia of this, the terminology would disappear. But one should not undervalue the never-ending to and fro motion between common sense and the specialized meaning of scientific terms. The positive as well as negative effects of these exchanges may favor or curb, according to the case, the heuristic discovery or intuitive understanding of new ideas. In other terms, as emphasized by the philosopher and linguist Mary Hesse, metaphors possess an essential cognitive function. Analyzing this function amounts to erasing the illusion typical of a scientific attitude, that it might be possible to draw a line between the good, adequate, and bad, abusive, uses of metaphor, whatever the peculiarities of the scientific discourse. Here is a quote by Mary Hesse. There is no ideal literal sense by means of which all pervasive metaphor is to be constrained. Metaphor remains the necessary mode of speech to be constrained by, rather by the norms and evaluations in terms of which the human realm is interpreted and utopias in ideologies and religious worlds are structured. 
just as metaphorical discourse has to be placed at the center of language so that we may understand both it and the literal discourse as its special case, so the human evaluated worlds in which our practical and spiritual affairs are conducted have to be placed at the center of life so that we may understand both them and the descriptive scientific worlds we have constructed out of them a special case. I think it's a wonderful quotation. End of quotation. Leaving for a moment the narrow confines of physics, it may be noted that nowadays such metaphors abound in the life, life sciences. Think, for instance, of the use of informational notions, code, message, and so on in genetics. The role of these metaphors has been studied with particular attention by Evelyn Fox Keller, a well-known historian of biology. She writes, for instance, I quote, the core of my argument is that much of the theoretical work involved in constructing explanations of development from genetic data is linguistic that is, depends on productive use of the cognitive tensions generated by multiple meanings, by ambiguity, and more generally by the introduction of novel metaphors. Most philosophers, and even many scientists, have long since abandoned the traditional view of scientific language as, ideally at least, literal and univocal uniquely corresponding to the entities and processes that make up the real world. But the specter this tradition cast on the use of metaphors and other linguistic tropes in science dies hard. And the conviction persists among some that when language is not literal, it is therefore less than literal, at best that metaphorical language offers a provisionally useful heuristic to be dispense, dispensed with as soon as possible, and at worst, as both Hobbes and Locke believed, a merely ornamental or downright deceptive intrusion that ought not to be admitted in proper scientific discourse. Yet, as historians and philosophers have increasingly come to appreciate, close observations of scientists, of scientists at work, either in the present or in the past, reveals that they simply cannot function under such a harsh mandate. To make sense of their day-to-day -day efforts, they need to invent words, expressions, forms of speech that can indicate or point to phenomena for which they have no natural description. It could well be the case that life scientists, as they tackle more complex and less formal problems than the colleagues dealing with physical sciences, are more prone to recognize the fecund, fecund ambiguities of language. That's a hope. Bewitched by the robust positivity of the science, the advocates of neoscientism forget that it is the simplicity of the very limited aspects of the world studied by physics, which within its narrow domain enables it to develop an efficient formalism, thus partly, partly protecting it against its own verbal blunderings. Say it more simply, our equations are a sort of protection against our words. Anyone happy to weed a small and well-kept garden, that is physicist, should not try teaching lessons to those attempting to clear much wider and more exposed fields. As human and social sciences show an order of difficulty incommensurable and much higher, much higher than the study of nature, the textuality is of an entirely different nature, precisely. They cannot be content to solve problems of terminology or invent figures of style, but must work at the very heart of language. Only by mobilizing all the resources of, 
of the imagination, and not all the references of culture, can the attempt to produce effects of meaning much subtler than the trite agreement between experimentation and theoretization, both under the spell of technicity and instrumentality. The cure proposed by people like Sokal and Brickman here would be worse than the alleged illness. In their zeal for eradicating the parasites, which are supposed to deface or disguise the poor, weak social and human sciences, they could well demolish the whole delicate and subtle construction. We'll now conclude. Epistemological criticism indeed is more than ever an obligation and one should not leave unanswered blatant misuses of scientific concept. Such criticism, however, should start with self-criticism. It is within the very production of knowledge that a better awareness of thought and language must be established. Physics has the advantage of being a logical mathematical science, and the rigor of its formalization mitigates the deficiencies of its enunciation, <coughs> at least within its specific working. But if so many false interpretations arise, as soon as the physicist's knowledge escapes them, they should first blame themselves and their own inability to elucidate the significance of their discoveries. We cannot accept for the natural sciences the singular status according to which they produce purely formal knowledge spared the need to develop a common meaning, which of course will be an ever elusive and mobile one. It is true that abusive metaphors drawn from physics can be not only ridiculous, but pernicious, as well when they tend to confer the authority of the hardest of all sciences on the abuse and flimsy statements. But it is not, is it not, sorry, is it not necessary to question first the nature of this authority? Neoscientism here works in the opposite direction, as its arguments tend to strengthen this very authority, since it amounts to judging the social and human sciences not according to their own criteria of validity and relevance, but on behalf of the exact sciences which then one is tempted to dub inhuman and asocial. The purist, not to say Puritan, fervor with which Sokol, Brickman, and the followers hunt down unauthorized references to their discipline may in any case backfire against its very interests. For the abuses they deplore prove at least that physical science maintains its links with the ambient social discourse, and that even, if in, even in its distorted forms, it continues to fuel common representations of the world. Nothing could be more dangerous for the very survival of the scientific endeavor than to isolate it within a sanitary cordon. Were scientists prepared to exert an absolute prophylaxis they would run the risk of sterilization and even sterility. This is why meetings like the physics and philosophy conferences organized here in Split are today a necessity for the very sake of science. So thank you for organizing this conference.
Okay, so uh, thank you very, very much, Professor Levy Leblon, for this beautiful, very delicate uh, detail of all the meanings uh, and uh, all the discussion. So I really appreciate this, and it was. Uh, I would like to see the text printed, actually, because I think there's so many information. Yes. Yeah, thank you very much. The text will be available to anybody. Because it, it, it's, uh, I didn't take any notes because uh, it's too much uh, to, to read. So. Perhaps I should not even ask questions because without notes in front of me. But anyway, I have a few uh, remarks. I, I'm a scientist myself. I'm a liquid state physicist. And I know this uh, SOCAL affair. And I think that uh, I will just w want to mention that there are a few, few points of this SOCAL affair that are invariants, invariant, and cannot be attacked from any point of view, either scientific or philosophical. And I think this invariant is... Uh, is, this is not what you question. Uh, so I would like to point a few things. First, uh, we, we, we all uh, converse to words. I mean, words and are really important. We cannot do anything without words. I mean, we, we speak and everything. They are like signals, right? Now, uh, I would like to quote uh, Lewis Carroll, who, man, who has this uh, beautiful metaphor of mot valise. I don't know how to translate this in English. He's British. So it means that every word is like a, a, a travel suitcase. I don't know how he said that, because I never read Lewis Carroll. Mot valise means that in every word, you, have a, you open the word, and it's full of meaning, right? Just like if you were taking. So this is, this is unavoidable. For every word, like for example, if you take the word electron, there is, it's full of meaning, the, 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 gene, the, the genealogy of the word, and so on. But these words are not used by the scientist to designate others than very precise properties. Like for example, when you, you use electron by, uh, by throughout history of the science, by any scientist, it is invariant. Like today, what is des designated by the electron is the same object as was designated by electron 10 years ago, 5 years ago, or since the... Actually, it's not entirely true, because we know that the electron is a composite object. But I will not go into this detail. The electron is not what is. But anyway, if you limit it to this, to not, it's a composite object, but it's not proved yet, totally. There is no theory for that. It's just uh, something we observe experimentally. It's called fractionalization. I don't, not, this is another word. <laughs> it, has con it contains many. So, so, so the word electron, so now, because the word electron has a philosophical meaning, because it means amber and everything, it can be used. You can open this word and take few parts of this word and misuse it, or, or not misuse it, but you use it in another context. But what is invariant here is that any student or professor teaching electrons will always refer to this object, and everyone will know what electron means in every, everywhere in the world in a physics course. But if a physicist or any scientist write a book where he used the word electron in connection with a wider meaning, then he himself puts in danger and is not referring to the same electron. He's referring to some other conceptual ideas that may come around. And I think this is what you pointed to when you were saying that the, the, phys the physicist or the scientific themselves uh, for example, when Stephen Hawking writes a book about black holes and he, he just goes on on babbling about philosophical meaning, he's not talking about the, black, the, signi, magne, man, the physical object, black hole, over which every scientist and every student in physics will agree. It's an invariant object. He will be talking about uh, what I will, again, I refer to Mauvalis. It means that you, when you open the word, there are several meanings. So physicists themselves and any scientist can expose himself uh, dangerously to the same kind of hoax uh, that uh, Sokal um, applied to. So, but we are not referring, I mean, we, at, we, sh we should be very careful not to refer to, so when we criticize scientists and we, we should not refer to the word, the, the, how would I say, the constricted part of the word they refer to, but they play the same game as the philosopher or the thinkers when they want to use the, 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 for example, when a physicist writes about the meaning of universe or something like that, is in fact philosophing. He's writing, he's talking about philosophy. And every time he will use the word electron or black hole or whatever, he will refer to the invariant object. But if it was only talking about, it will be a textbook about physics. It will not be available to anyone. May, may I answer? 
Sorry? May I answer you? No, no, let, let, let me just finish. I would, I would just, I would just... You made your point and you repeated it, so... But I will just finish to, to, with the word, but making another point is that uh, um, l'habit ne fait pas le moine. I don't know how to care say that. It means that it's not because you, you address a word uh, it, that it, it doesn't cover all the meanings of the, of the... So I will stop there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the comment, but I am afraid I completely disagree with you. Uh, right from the examples you, you just quoted, it is not true that electron is an, has an invariant meaning. When Thompson uh, discovered the electron, named it, he certainly did not have the same conception of an electron as we have today. Would it be only because quantum physics was not born? So uh, Thomson believed the electron to be a small particle light object of classical uh, uh, term, like a small pebble uh, in powder, which means that uh, when quantum physics was born 20 or 30 years later, the word electron was endowed with a very different meaning. We now know today that it is not a particle, not a wave, uh, it is something else, it's a quantum object. And you yourself said very well that perhaps, as uh, some people are working today, perhaps electron is not an elementary object, as uh, most people have uh, believed for a few days. So if you compare the a real physical text, I'm not going outside of physics. You look at a paper by Thompson, you look at uh, what, uh, I don't know, uh, Rutherford wrote in the 20s, you look at what is written today, the word electron does not have the same meaning. Same for a uh, uh, lot of problems concerning, uh, well, let's say, for instance, the, uh, the universe. The very word universe has changed its meaning through the evolution of cosmology. So, I'm, you, you see, the point is, it's the, the point which, on which we could probably, probably could agree, is that at a given time, there is a consensus about the use of the word. At a given time, most physicists, when they use the word electron, refer to the same mental construction. I say most physicists, and fortunately, some of them do not, because we need some dissensus. If we want science to progress, we want knowledge to progress, we need to have people who disagree, who put forward new ideas, which most of the time will be wrong or irrelevant. Most new ideas are just uh, going to, to the trash can. But from time to time, one emerges. So I would not follow you uh, concerning this uh, interpretation of uh, Sokal affair and more generally in stressing this, uh, what you call the invariance on the world. world. Quite on the contrary, I think that if you stress the uh, variability, the historicity of language, that's an asset for physics. It's good for physics because it, uh, enable physicists to think more deeply about what they uh, try to do. Look, I could give another example, which I'm, of course, aware of, but which is very interesting. Look at the notion of field. I make an allusion to that. When Faraday invents the notion, he, he thinks of the field like a sort of a concrete description of the state of an underlying medium. So you see, it's like a, a field of wheat where you see the, uh, uh, the thing going in the different direction. Now, when Maxwell starts, it's a more different, it's a different idea. He has the idea of an ether and things of that sort, a mechanical model. And then 20 years later, the notion of field emerges with the final Maxwell, but also with Einstein, as a physical entity by itself, not needing an underlying medium. So you see that there is a whole history of this world. And if you don't follow this history, it's a pity. It's a pity because you are prone to, uh, to make a confusion between these different meanings, which are very interesting uh, uh, each other. So we may continue the discussion when you will have the paper and we might argue on the specific